Donna Dixon with Houston Housing Authority. Wendy Caesar with Houston Housing Authority. Resident of this area and very familiar with Kenner Homes. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Barnes, Executive Director, co founder of the Community Artists Collective. My name is Lizette Cobb, and I live in the area, and I'm the resident anthropologist. <laughs> My name is Preston Allen. I'm the director for nonprofit community development at Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. Bryce Coates, Clark County Property from the local real estate board. Good afternoon. I'm Jeanette Cheryl with Change Happiness. I'm Jeffrey Lowe, a professor in the Department of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy, Texas Southern University. Good afternoon. My name is Cedric Johnson. I'm a community aide for Commissioner Harris. The commissioner for the Hill Franklin Media Parish County. I'm Brian Gage with the Housing Authority. Hi, I'm Kathy Freeman. I'm also with the Housing Authority. I'm Daryl Bunch. I'm the Executive Director of Building the Grounds here in Texas Southern. I'm Tim Riley. I'm the Executive Director of Facilities here in Texas Southern. Um, and we've got Commissioner Richards. I'm a lot of witches. I'm the Vice Chair of the Houston Housing Authority. Of the board of commissioners. I'm Heather Hill. I'm the chair of the board of directors at the Houston, Texas YMCA. We have an after school program in the spend millions and millions of 
of dollars to revitalize CUNY, how can we make sure to work with everybody in the neighborhood, everybody in the community, to really help transform the community, not just the public housing property? Um, and the third thing is, this is a grant application, and so if we don't win the grant, none of this really happens. And so we're putting this together um, very quickly. The grant application is due at the end of the month, um, and we can talk more about specifics. But those those are the three main things that I wanted to talk about, um, and probably not to keep you here too long. Um, so. HUD issued the, the NOFA uh, for funding availability. We are hoping to apply for the maximum grant. Yes, ma'am. Was that? No, no, oh, no. Okay. Just, uh, we're hoping to apply for a half a million dollar grant, which is the maximum grant. Uh, was that? A, I was blocking the screen. No. Uh, uh, we have to develop a comprehensive transformation plan with the money. So the application itself doesn't ask us to say what the plan is because we don't know what the plan is yet because we haven't had a community-wide planning process. Um, and so that's what the money is for, is to develop a comprehensive transformation plan. Once we've developed a comprehensive transformation plan, then the housing authority is in a very good position to be able to apply for an implementation grant of choice neighborhoods. And that's where the big money is. Uh, those grants are in the millions of dollars, in the tens of millions of dollars, uh, and that's the sort of capital that it would take to truly transform CUNY. Uh, a half a million dollars doesn't take care of the roofs of CUNY. Um, finally, uh, <coughs> one of the reasons that there are a lot of staff here is because they are working on a deadline of May 28th to get this all done. Uh, choice neighborhoods has three main goals. One is housing, the second is people, and the third are neighborhoods. And there are uh, sub indicators uh, under each of those activities that when HUD, that HUD wants us to look at. Uh, when they build the housing, they want us to build an energy efficient, well-managed, mixed income is the model that they want. Um, people, they want us to focus not just on housing, but on people's education outcomes, on employment outcomes, on their health care, on their affordability. Um, and finally, they want us to look at neighborhoods. Uh, and that includes amenities like parks, schools, safety, the public and private investments and partnerships. Um, so that's really the goal of the implementation grant. And that's what we would be planning for in the planning grant. Um, and so that's that's what we would spend the next 12 to 18 months if we won the grant working on is developing the transformation plan. So the choice neighborhood approach is a comprehensive plan to transform and revitalize both distressed HUD housing and the surrounding neighborhoods. And they really are focusing on the collaboration with the residents, with the community, with all the governmental entities uh, and other stakeholders. And th this meeting today was really designed as a initial stakeholders list. Uh, we sent out about 80 invitations and when we come to doing the planning, if we win the grant, we would seek to have a regular working group of uh, probably 20 to 25 people who would be able to represent all of these different areas and talk about what is the community plan. There'd be a series of meetings, uh, but there would be a core group of folks who would be responsible for developing the transformation plan. Why did we choose CUNY? One of the reasons is CUNY is the oldest public housing that the Houston Housing Authority has in its portfolio, built in 1939, uh, 550, I don't know why I said possibly, there are certain criteria that we had to meet for this application uh, that HUD says it would be a distressed neighborhood. Um, the first are the old age and the antiquated designs of many of the structures uh, surrounding King Hills. The poverty 
poverty rate uh, of the census tract, and it actually, the, the map uh, encompasses three census tracts, uh, and we have apportioned the census tracts accordingly, and the, the census poverty rate is 47%. Uh, according to the, the standard assessments, Blackshear and Nate are low-performing schools, and that's one of the indicators that HUD wants us to be looking at. And the target area has a vacancy <coughs> rate of over 25%. So that means there's a lot of empty parcels and vacant units uh, that are an indication of distress. So we're looking in the third ward. We're proposing the broader orange beach area. Um, you can see the cross streets there. Yep. I'm gonna, there's a map slide that comes up. Yeah. Those are our proposed boundaries. Um, it made a nice square, but the, the challenge is you can't select the entire third ward. You have to be able to propose to HUD some sub neighborhood boundary. Um, and there, those are choices made by main cross streets and, and boundaries that we thought would make sense. And then you also, when you're looking at the census data, um, following census tracts is also helpful in terms of being able to determine whether or not it would meet the HUD criteria. 72% of the development area is in track 3124. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the other tracks have other areas. And so that's the proposal. Uh, I guess the first question is, um, does this block seem to make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, the question I have is a concern, and, and I know we're in baseball, we're in all plays, we haven't even got the first base with an application. Right. Approved. But you have management district boundaries, you have turf boundaries, you have other projects where Johnson is doing this. Yep. I just think in terms of putting together this plan that I would hope that the people that sit at the table clearly understand the impact that their decision will have on other future development. A absolutely. I think that's uh, part of the objective is, and, and I have spoken with the Reverend and, and invited him here tonight as well, uh, but is to coordinate with all of the other activity. Um, and in some ways, it's it's a good segue to why did I invite everybody? Part of the reason why I invited everybody is for this to be successful, it needs to be a community-based effort. It can't just be the housing authority saying, hey, we're gonna do something at CUNY. Um, it really needs to be a broader initiative from the community. And one of the things that HUD does straight off the top is they score us based on the number of matches that we're able to get based on other investments that other partners will be making. Um, so I'm not, I'm not gonna ask anybody for, for straight up dollars, although I, I would take them. Um, but what we're looking for are other investments of planning that your agencies or nonprofits or schools might be planning and would be willing to commit that if we win this half a million dollars, you would commit to doing planning uh, in the area as well. So if the Houston School District said, hey, we're gonna be doing some planning around school utilization, um, that could count towards our match. Uh, if Reverend Johnson uh, was gonna do more planning, we could count that, we could count TERS money. Uh, if the library was saying, hey, yeah, we're we'd like to do some thinking about the libraries in that target area. All of those things can count as a match for us, and that'll be critical uh, for us to score high is the amount of matching funds that we might receive. So it, does anyone have a strenuous objection to this area? Uh, I, yes. I, I have a, not an objection, but a preference for as broad an area as uh, 
in the planning phase as possible, and then maybe uh, have that particular section that's targeted or another uh, as the focus for this phase of the implementation. It would seem to me that now is the time to plan broadly, as broadly as possible, to create a broad vision for the greater third ward neighborhood, and then work on the development of a plan for a specific section in phases. I, I think I would agree from a planning perspective. Uh, from HUD's perspective, they wanted uh, the, the third ward or the greater third ward, they would say is too big for redevelopment of CUNY to have a massive impact on the greater third ward. Um, so they're, they're saying I, you have to start with the distressed HUD asset and then draw lines around that in terms of what area. Um, so I, I agree that uh, what we would like to do is integrate this planning effort with other planning efforts um, and, and leverage the larger discussion. Uh, but for our application, they require it to be smaller. Yes, sir. Yep. yep. Uh, yes. <coughs> uh, my question, and I don't have an objection either, it's more of a question of clarity. Uh, having been somewhat involved in the uh, planning grant activity in Memphis around the banks, having clarity. Uh, I'm wondering uh, in this area, and since we're looking at uh, distressed park property, if you will, what is the occupancy rate of, of CUNY homes right now? CUNY right. homes is about 100% occupied. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what is the <coughs> uh, population? Of that area. You, you told us of poverty, but I don't know how many residents actually live in that area. Ah, I've got that information. You got it. I don't think I have it on the slide. Sorry, it just leads to the idea about not just occupancy in CUNY, but we have a waiting list, so the need for. Um, you know, supportive housing is great in this city. And we only provide a very small slice of that. So we have a great waiting list for supportive housing in the city of Houston. So it's a huge need that we're, we're trying to address. And, and how, many, uh, how many units is 100% occupied? How many units are there? So 550 uh, of the public housing units. Uh, we're going to pull up um, 2,000 households in the highlighted area. Um, so cutting to the chase, what, what the Housing Authority is looking for um, is support for the application. Um, it's really a process. If we win the, if we win the grant, uh, it's really starting a conversation. Um, secondly, anybody who's willing to provide us a letter of support uh, is certainly going to be helpful in our grant application process. Uh, many of you received an email from me and it, it included a draft uh, letter of support. Um, if you didn't get that or if you want to submit a letter and you don't have a draft, um, please contact Donna. Um, and. She'll be able to get you a card and we'll be able to coordinate that. Um, we're looking for letters very, very quickly uh, by the 20th to be able to turn this around. And then for anybody who thinks that they might be able to identify a in-kind matching grants or matching services, uh, that'll be critical uh, to the success of the application. Uh, and those are things, I, you know, even student time or student projects uh, are things that can count towards the, the grant match. Uh, and we'll be talking to the city and to others about <coughs> how we can really leverage this half a million dollars into something more to be able to really do a great job of planning. Um, and implementation, because I think- Well, the implementation, so even the, the grants, the, the matches is only for planning. Uh, implementation is a, is a separate phase. Um, and that's really, 
all I have to cover. And so I, I think there are questions. Um, Can you talk about yeah. the last time that CUNY has had any comprehensive rehab or assessment? Uh, I believe it was 2011. Comprehensive modernization happened. Or you just have to modernize various spaces. Is it? Yeah, it, it's been done over phases over many years. The, the problem with CUNY is not necessarily that any one particular unit is so distressed that it's uninhabitable. Um, the problem with CUNY is it was built in 1939 when we had a different standard of living. And so right now at CUNY, uh, you've got a four bed, you have a couple of four bedroom apartments uh, with refugee families living there with six kids, seven kids, two parents, and one bathroom, and no central air conditioning. That's, that's part of the problem with, with CUNY. Um, you've got tiny apartments, um, and it's not necessarily well connected to the rest of the community. Uh, it feels very different than the rest of the community, and architecturally speaking, it, it is closed off. Um, and we really want to figure out how to leverage uh, all of the community assets so that when CUNY is transformed, it is also transformative on the rest of the neighborhood. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the big vision. Um, and this is really just the start of that process. Will the planning include um, helping the current residents of CUNY to move uh, into neighborhood existing housing or new housing uh, to transition out of CUNY while it is being redeveloped? So could, could everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay, so, so the question is, um, would the planning process help the current residents move into other housing uh, in the community or, or elsewhere? No, in and, the community. In the community. So the, the answer is this is strictly a planning grant and we can't use any of this money for anything other than creating the transformation plan. Um, no money would be used for relocation, no money would be used uh, for demolition or construction. Uh, it is simply to create a, a comprehensive plan. And in some ways this is very, very different than some of the efforts that have happened, uh, the most recent effort that happened in the third ward uh, was the Urban Land Institute. We held a number of, of meetings, and interviewed a number of people, and, and produced a report. Um, that initiative, and I'm, I'm guessing, but that initiative was probably not $100,000 worth of effort and, and time. Um, a half a million dollar, a million dollar planning effort uh, is going to be a remarkable effort that has the resources so that everybody in the community's voice can be heard, so that there can be uh, extensive outreach to encourage participation. Um, and it, it is a, a whole different level of planning than this project has ever received in the past. Yes, sir? Okay, and then we'll come back to you. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I'm just, a, just a little history. I've worked here at Texas Southern <clears throat> many years ago. And we had a close relationship with them. And we had a situation where we were drawing out of money to try to buy Kimmy Holmes for dog tours. So that's where the rumors started. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the point I'm making to you is you stirred up some, we stirred up some ads and we had some issues. It's very sensitive and very delicate with how you approach this. The other part to this is I think what Ms. Barnes was asking about, you know, placing these residents. And, and, and then you're coming back saying we need a decision to me. It's hard for me to put my arms around the bill. And I'm not saying it's, it's not a good thing. I'm not saying so the, it's not yeah. hang on, it's good thing. Until we have answers, questions and answers that will satisfy the residents as well as the community. And I would hope that at least from my perspective, when you leave today, you know, you don't walk out assuming that you met with 30 people. Yeah. And well, 29 may agree with the whole concept. I'm still trying to put my arms around it and take that, assuming that that support 
than your letter writing campaign because we got to get you have the urban league in here, you have a whole bunch of other stakeholders in here to clearly understand the impact of those boundaries to other co future development and to have people to sign on not knowing the impact. I'm just saying. Well, it, and so the, the, the main thing from, that I want to try to communicate is the money is in support of a planning process. That's right. And so I, I'll be the first one to say I don't know the answer of what the planning process results in. I don't know the answer of the transformation plan because I am just one voice right. in this larger process. Um, and that's why I, I guess I'm trying to explain the difference between a robust half a million, million dollar planning process versus all of these individual efforts. Um, if we win this grant, this planning process would be unlike anything I think the city has seen to give that amount of planning dollars on that small of an area. Um, and it, it's a process that I think everybody should have questions about and everybody has thoughts about what we think this should look like. And, I, and I'm not gonna say that I have the answers, but that's why if we win the application, we'll be able to, to have that conversation long into the night with, with many, many people over many, many months to come up with the right solution. And the resources to do Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. So that can be somewhat clear. Are we talking about enhancing A, community homes, community area, B, surrounding area of the community, of the community homes, we're talking about community homes, revitalization, rebuilding, remodeling, et cetera, and Surrounding areas. Yep, so that's an excellent question. So the application requires that a distressed HUD property, as defined by HUD, is in the <coughs> catchment area. So that's CUNY. Um, but it also requires that a school be in the area. And uh, we've got several. Um, and it requires that it is broader than that. If we win the implementation grant, which is really step two, step one is the planning grant, but if we win the implementation grant, that money uh, then is for the area. And so really this is saying step one, what would a transform, transform that part of third ward look like and what would it require to get there? And part of what it does is it does say, well, what else is happening there? What's happening to the schools there? What what are the private developers doing? What is the TERS doing? And it tries to weave them all together and then leverage uh, the investment in the HUD asset. Because in, in the past, what would happen is the housing authority would just go and do whatever the housing authority thought was best, right? Yeah. Um, and not for the whatever the housing authority thought was best. <laughs> you know. Well, that's what I've been told. Um, and that didn't work well for the rest of the community because they just did what they thought was best. This is very, very different and it's saying, before we even talk about let's just do something in CUNY, it's let's spend a year and a substantial amount of resources understanding what the community wants for the community, of which CUNY is a major portion of that community. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, you, you certainly explain that well. I'm wondering, in terms of your partners that you identified, you know, right. are, have you, are there gaps? Because as, as certainly as, um, as HUD and this approach is interested in identifying the assets uh, in the neighborhood and a way to expand those and build that capacity, I'm wondering if you've identified um, areas where partners might be needed that um, that could add a little bit more depth to. So I, I think from a planning application perspective, um, I, I don't think a representative from Metro has shown up yet. Metro was invited. You know, Metro is doing some major planning. 
right down that corridor. I'm hoping to leverage some of their planning dollars to help match our, what we're doing. Um, and, and the metro changes are definitely going to change the community. Uh, so I think they definitely need to be at the table. Um, the school district needs to be at the table as we talk about the, the larger their community. Um, and, you know, and I think that those are some of the biggest assets. Then you've got the, the, the city and uh, the city neighborhoods department. Uh, the city health department is here. The city library is here. Um, and the, the police department. I mean, you know, and those are the county. Those are the major government players. Um, but then I think it's it's the faith community. Uh, I think it's the private development. Um, and there's a strong tradition in this neighborhood of nonprofits um, who definitely know this neighborhood better than I ever will. Uh, that need to be a part of the process and, and giving input. And we're invited. And you're invited. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, two questions. One, in your grant proposal, um, who are the participants in that proposal? Where are you going to drive those individuals, assuming they'll be? live bodies and troops on the ground. Right. Where are you going to derive those? What is their level of expertise and their tie to the yep. community, if any? And then my second question is, uh, what is the total number? You say there are 550 units. That means 100%. And you have a tremendous waiting list. If you go expand to the larger community, how many units are you? do you think possibly make? Uh, you may target it. so maybe it doubles to a thousand or that may be an unknown so I, I would say to answer the second question first that's an unknown and I think some of that is a real community conversation um, some of the, the interesting demographics of CUNY you have a large number of elderly households um, and so I could conceive of an elderly building uh, as a part of whatever the redevelopment would be so that they could be in more appropriate units, uh, single floor, you know, not have to deal with the stairs, that sort of thing. Um, but that's, I mean, that's just me talking. Um, the first part of your question. So who would be doing all of this work? Yes. The grant, actually, we don't have to say who's doing all of the work. The, the real answer is, regardless of who's hired, you all are doing all of the work. Um, it, the community is doing the work. Uh, there would be professional planners uh, who would be hired. In all likelihood, it would be a firm, uh, not hiring a staff person. Uh, and it would be a facilitation. Um, and they would have to know uh, the community. Um, and that's not to say that they necessarily have to be from the community to be able to know the community, um, but uh, much like the professor said, hey, you know, I've, I've done similar things in other cities. What's that experience? Yeah, planners who know what they're doing, who have done this in other cities, um, they know how to, to step into that role. So that's that's what we would be looking at. But I mean, the, the real answer is the community is the one that's got to do the, the the real work, um, and then we hire somebody to coordinate it all. And, Make sure that we show up. For, for yes, what would you hear back in terms of our success on the grant? How many grants are they uh, allotting? And what's the number? Was it 25? They, they, they didn't set a dollar amount yet as to how many grants are they allotting. Last year they did about 20 25 planning grants. And I think they did eight implementation grants. Um, they are dealing with sequester, like I'm dealing with sequester, and so I think they're going to look at all of these things and decide how many they're going to award. Um, they don't actually give themselves deadlines that they publish and say, we're going to make our decision 30 days afterwards. Uh, I would say probably 90 days afterwards, maybe 120 days afterwards at the outside. The process of the actual planning is that six months, a year? That would be uh, one year to 18 months. 
Um, and then the implementation, that's another competitive process. So competitive right. process. But we're really looking at something that might be, you know, two to four years before we actually turn the dirt. Yep. Yeah. Sure, in terms of leverage resources, if you want us to then the support letter, if you just talk about what we'll bring to the table during the planning process or the implementation process. Just the planning process right now. Um, but anything that you can creatively say, oh yeah, we're planning, doing assessments. Then we need to go back to the letter. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I came in late, uh, but on the, you said that the people who plan this community necessarily have to be from Third Ward, and I would like to know why. Because if it's a professional planner, um, they're a professional planner. This is what they do, and they can do it in any city. I'm not saying that it, it would not have to be a person from the third ward or not from the third ward? I mean, just from Houston, because you said that you think they can come in and they would know the neighborhood better, just as well or better than the people no, 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 who no, were here. That, that, so, but before you came in, I said, I don't know the answers. You know the answers. You will know this neighborhood better than I ever know this neighborhood. The same is true of a professional planner. The professional planner knows how to elicit the input though from the people that know it and they know how to make sure that they're getting the, the input from everybody. But then he would have to, um, man, there was a, a professional planner just couldn't talk to everybody, let's say everybody in this room who probably don't live in Third Ward, didn't grow up in Third Ward, so you can get a lot of input from different people. And I look at contracts down across the city and I see people working, but we have to make sure that we have people in this neighborhood. I'm not talking who he talks to. He can talk to a lot of people who don't have to come in the neighborhood and uh, say he got input. Input means from the neighbors that people actually vote in this, these precincts, 85, 86, and whatever, uh, that's on the voting roll and actually live here. I'm not talking about outsiders coming in here wanting to get right. subcontracts so, so you have to have someone in here and then i want some people all when the money comes in i can ride down rosedale right now and uh, you don't see anybody look like anybody in third ward nobody is working on even a sidewalk and i think before we sign off we need to know what your the contract you're signing with stipulations in it because so, to tell yeah. me Anyone can come in and he can do a survey and talk I, well, to think, quote certain people, I don't believe just, it. So before you came in, I, I explained that this is different than any planning process that the third ward has been a part of before. And that's because this is a lot more money than has ever been spent I'm on a planning I'm, effort before. I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about people I, that's I gonna understand. work on the project, design the project. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about five, hundred thousand dollars that's not a lot of money anyway you you know when you can build you go on the other side they're building million dollar senior citizen facilities right so you're not talking about any money compared right. to what you're going to do for other people i'm saying what how are you going to ensure this community that you have a voice as to who the quote project manager is going to take about half of the money anyway and who is going to be the subcontractors, contractors, and the people that are going to work so they will not be sitting there looking at other people they bring in to do the work. So the first answer is you all are going to be doing the real work. Whoever gets hired, it is the community input that is most important. So you're going to do the hiring? The Board yeah. of Commissioners passes the, but, the, if there's RFP, I mean, because I think that's what you're asking. When the RFPs come over, who's going to get the work? Then the Board of Commissioners with the Houston Housing Authority will vote on. Okay, that so what we, that's what you're saying. That's not what he's what saying. Because what you're saying is that <laughs> the community is not going to have any input anyway because the Housing Authority is going to make the decision and the, the final decision. The decision hasn't been made yet because. A, no, I'm just going by what she just said. But I'm to be honest about who makes the decision. Yeah, that's, you're honest. Right. 
<laughs> the yeah. money hasn't been awarded, right. so no RFP has been drafted. Well, she's saying what he does. And she understands what I'm saying. I'm saying who's going to make the decision, and it will not be what you're just saying, the company people who live in this area and this precinct that vote. That, we will not be, because if you want the precinct, I'll get the list for the people who actually live here. Well, I mean, I, I, okay, this is important. I know it's important in the I know you're trying to step out of it, because you're saying we just haven't a plan, and we've not done any work, no one's knocked down a building or put up a building. But I want you to know that we have a strong tradition and a strong practice of not only hiring from the community, but our job is to hire from people who live in, in public housing so that those opportunities Thank you. lift them out of there. We have a strong tradition of that. And when we ask people to put in bids, we ask them to put that as part of their bid to win and secure work with us. So that's key and foremost to what we do. Because every investment dollar should be an opportunity to move people out of poverty on the margins of poverty into a better way of life. So we are and we are working on reforming our policies and procedures for that to strengthen it even more. And if you come to a board meeting, we'll give you a, a, a report that comes on board <coughs> about how many people from the Youth and Housing Authority we've hired. How many people have, have participated in programs to be able to have escrow accounts of ten thousand dollars and use those to get down payments on houses? Yeah. So we are very much committed to that as commissioners, and, and Mr. Snowden can speak to that because he he's on the you know front lines of that all the time. We understand the importance of investment dollars in our community. We know we only get them so often, and when we get them, we've got to stretch them every bit as far as they need. So that's what our, our Board of Commissioners have been committed to. So I understand the question. Bob. Question? Uh, yes. Within the grant, as partners, are there different or weighted categories that we might, um, that we should know about uh, in terms of what you need, what you're requesting from us? And, and certainly, so for example, um, when it comes to choice name because if there are existing partnerships or collaborations uh, that are already in place that can strengthen the application, is that is that something that uh, would be uh, really So valuable? yeah, le le leveraging existing uh, relationships um, and collaborations that are already in place is definitely helpful. It shows that there's already a uh, capacity and a level of planning. Um, there's no weighted relationship other than the relationship with the city uh, indicated from financial support directly from the city is worth a point. But other than that, uh, the, the, the matching and the letters of support are, are equal weight, whether it's TSU or, or whether it's Project Row House. They, they weigh in the same. Can I, I want to say something slightly, and I want to say this when we like to residents of public housing. There are not people throwing money at poor people. There are not money, no one's throwing money at poor people. And there are less money coming down the pipeline for supportive housing, not more. And so the area we're talking about is really in high impoverished neighborhood. And we know all of the rewarders are doing that. Some parts of third ward are doing really, really well. And so we have an opportunity. This is not, we, we haven't even come up with a, we have an opportunity to consider how we can create a better even distribution of resources in this community. And we know the area we're talking about is some of the most economically depressed parts of this community. And so, and I just love Omaha, Nebraska, and you know what their model was? They tore down all of their major public housing and scattered people all throughout the city of Omaha. So that is a model called move to opportunity. So if we don't really advocate for a different approach, moving opportunities to communities, there is a national movement to disperse people in, in communities of color, which happen to be sometimes poor, in public housing, many times poor. So we have an opportunity to fight against that model and bring development into this community. And so we're not saying what we're going to do. We're saying let's at least consider a plan for our community because we may not get these opportunities again. You know that HUD is being restricted from funding year after year after year. And so this is an opportunity. You voted for a president. You got him in. 
He's doing some things. This is an opportunity. You know, we don't know what's going to happen after this administration. So we need to really move while we have an opportunity to move. So I'm just really encouraging us to think about this as an opportunity. The deal is not done. What we're going to do, we can decide on that. But let's not miss the boat. It's just like at Ryan Middle School. Let's get the application in, and then we'll decide if we want it or not. But let's get the application in first. Thank you. And, and it, it, it is a reminder, it's a competitive application. It's, it is not a sure thing. Um, and really what it helps us do is become much better positioned for the big money application in, in a year or two. Um, I've got parking validation. Um, if folks want parking, and I, I can still answer more questions. Um, but we definitely would appreciate your support. Feel free to email me uh, or reach out to Don. Yeah, just one last question. Uh, it took intellectual um, capacity to sort of part of the grant to so part dollars and someone says going to come in and we'll do X, Y, Z, which is up to strengthen the community with that account as a I, I'm certainly willing to include it, and then if they don't like it, they just deduct that from my total. Yeah. Well, thank you all, and just remember, A, that my first message is we are not selling CUNY. Uh, Never sell CUNY. Not selling CUNY. Uh, and Colors will be let us sell CUNY. Planning grant, and it really is the community that's going to come up with the solutions. Uh, so I'm you're not selling sell. CUNY and you're not moving CUNY, you're just remodeling CUNY, right? We just We're actually CUNY. starting a community conversation about CUNY. To redevelop the... the but, yeah, in all, in all likelihood, it'd be revitalizing the CUNY in place. Well, thank you all for coming. And if you need parts from, well, like half of the people are housing for you, so... <laughs> <laughs> and we invite you to come tonight at 6 o'clock. You know, come to CUNY and talk to the residents and see what their thoughts are.